Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from uh, across Canada. Um, and welcome to today's uh, Finn Virtual Learning Series uh, segment on uh, Into the Future of the GC on uh, technical skills. Uh, I'm Joshua Frame. I'm National Chair of the Federal Youth Network. Um, and I am coming to you from uh, Ottawa, which is the uh, traditional uh, unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. Um, the Algonquin peoples have lived on this land since time immemorial. And we're grateful to have the opportunity to be present in this territory. Au fur et à mesure que nous progressons dans la session d'aujourd'hui, veuillez partager vos questions en utilisant le bouton uh, questions et réponses QA um, dans la langue de votre choix. Uh, vous pouvez uh, voter uh, pour les questions que vous uh, voulez poser en cliquant sur le bouton uh, thumbs up. Uh, je je m'excuse que le bouton thumbs up n'est pas uh, bilingue. Uh, so as we move through today's session, please share your comments uh, in the chat space um, and uh, provide your questions using the Q&A uh, button in the language of your choice. So please be uh, very clear to put your questions in the Q&A um, as opposed to the chat space. So the chat space can be used to engage with other, uh, other participants uh, or with panelists, um, but all questions should be in the Q&A as it allows for easier uh, management of those questions. Um, and you can vote for which questions you want to hear answered by using the uh, thumbs up button um, in the Q&A panel. Um, so that helps us to, to triage what you really wanna hear on today's panel. Um, so today we'll be going through some uh, pre-planned questions and then we'll go to uh, your participant questions. And we have three incredible panelists uh, with us today. Um, today's session is also being recorded. Um, so it will be online on our uh, FYN YouTube channel um, probably by about end of day tomorrow. Um, and uh, you'll be able to check there if you're not able to attend the full session or you wanna share it with your uh, colleagues or, or friends afterwards. Um, so we have three incredibly incredible panelists, as I mentioned. Um, so we'll uh, start with uh, introducing the three of them. Um, so Kieran, we will start with uh, you and welcome, uh, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Josh. My name's Karen Cooler. I'm joining you from Treaty 6 land here in Edmonton, Alberta. It's a traditional uh, lands of gathering place and traveling route for many diverse Indigenous communities. And we continue to, uh, so grateful that we continue to um, uh, benefit from those communities today. I, in addition to being from Edmonton, Alberta, I am a free agent, which is part of an internal mobile workforce. And I get the joy of moving from department to department. And one of the things I got to do, and the reason I'm here with you guys today is to talk about tools. And I, um, I informally created a toolbox or toolbox, a sandbox space, uh, where we could play with tools. So, uh, learned about tools that I could add to my toolbox. And uh, these included things like um, meeting platforms, uh, whiteboard tools, post-it notes. So that's part of why I'm here today. I'll pass it back to Josh or the next panelist as you wish. Absolutely. Uh, so our next uh, panelist is Christine Vizina. Uh, so Christine, would you like to uh, give us an intro and introduction, s'il vous plaît? Oui, absolument. Bonjour, je m'appelle Christine Vizina. I'm a digital communication advisor within the digital transformation team over at Health Canada. Uh, in my day to day for the past year, <laughs> uh, Health Canada, we've been, uh, I provide advice not only on the health team on Canada.ca, but I'm currently the lead on the get updates on COVID-19, the email subscription. Uh, I'm also a digital uh, literacy advisor. I completed the Discover Digital off course offered by the CSPS. Uh, by the way, I recommend every public servant to uh, take this course. I think it's I-205, the number, unless that changed, but yeah, Discover Digital. I also completed a digital bootcamp, uh, a 10 week certification offered by Apolitical. This is, uh, provides you an overview of all the digital era principle and practices uh, for the, for, that are good for public servant. And in the past year or two, I've also completed, completed like approximately 50 training. Uh, I've been obsessed with the training, I could say, but uh, I'm just curious to learn all about the different tools, what they can offer us. So I've been uh, playing around with a lot of tools also. So uh, looking forward to today's discussion. That's great. Thanks very much, Christine. 
Um, so we'll go over to uh, Alex McEachern. Sure. Hi, I'm Alex, and I'm the Chief of Staff to Aaron Snow, who is the CEO of the Canadian Digital Service, which is a division of Treasury Board. We're a relatively new organization whose mandate is to help change government to serve people better. And by that, we partner with departments to help rebuild or build from scratch public facing services. So we've worked with newcomers to Canada, with veterans, with low income Canadians. We also build platform products, which would be uh, products that solve common pain points. Uh, so we have a notification system that will send emails and we're working to make forms a little bit easier to fill out as well. Uh, I'm really excited to be here today. Awesome, thanks very much, Alex. Um, et je vais mentionner que cette session, c'est bilingue, alors on va changer les questions en anglais et puis en français. Um, et vous pouvez mettre vos questions, comme j'ai mentionné, uh, dans la langue de votre choix, utilisant la fonction uh, question uh, et réponse, ou QA. Um, so we'll be switching between English and French questions throughout the session. Um, there is no simultaneous interpretation for the session. We're, we're kind of having an actively bilingual session, um, as we do with all of our FIN virtual uh, learning series sessions. So, uh, but please put the questions in the Q&A in the language of your choice. Um, so we'll start off with the, uh, the first of our questions. Um, so uh, Alex, we'll start with you. So how did uh, COVID create the right uh, environment that allowed us to explore uh, new technology? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so I think about at the beginning of the pandemic where we didn't have enough VPN for all public servants to be able to get online and to work. We hadn't rolled out Teams yet. Um, and I think it was right around that time that I saw a really great sort of grassroots movement. People didn't have VPN, but they did have Wi-Fi, uh, which is something that they probably didn't have at their old department. Uh, and so I think we saw people using different collaboration tools and going on Twitter and just asking like, how can I get involved? How can I help? Um, and it's interesting to note that that change was, was grassroots and it wasn't systemic. So I, I think SSC did a really impressive job of getting enough VPN and capacity out there and rolling out teams. That's no small feat. They should be applauded for that. But as far as like real innovation and driving change, I think it was people at home in very challenging circumstances, juggling kids, juggling with this new reality, um, but who had Wi-Fi for the first time and who were just like, I'm gonna try a few things and if they don't work, they don't work, but I can't just sit on my hands and do nothing. I'm a public servant, I need to help the public uh, and I'm gonna scrub in however I can. So those are a few thoughts from me on, on how the pandemic actually created some really innovative opportunities for public servants. Absolutely. No, I, I remember with uh, Teams, some of the departments were saying like they had a three-year rollout plan and all of a sudden they were able to roll it out in like five days. Like when you when you have to do it, it, it definitely changes the environment for sure. Um, Kieran, your thoughts around uh, how COVID created the, the environment uh, that allowed us to explore new technology. So for me, COVID became the great equalizer. Uh, I work, uh, as I said, out of Edmonton, Alberta. And so I've been uh, on a distributed team well before we even talked about distributed teams. <laughs> um, and so it became the great equalizer, you know, no longer could people forget about me. Um, in fact, what happened and, you know, kudos to teams like Flex GC um, and Finn for it, what happened is people with those skills were able to support others as they were becoming new to these. And, and so things that, um, things that I thought, uh, were only unique to me because I didn't have as many people with that shared experience, I got to quickly learn, oh my gosh, I'm not the only one. And I got to tell you, that was absolutely thrilling. And then the other big thing, which we always have, and I don't know why I forget it, and maybe others do too, is the, the wonderful director I work for right now, she said, listen, I still need to do my work tell me, give me some recommendations. And I was, okay, great. That's, that's great. You know, like the door is nice and wide open. So why not leap onto that? Why not leap right through that door and find out what works and who best to do that with than people in general. So I can go into more detail, but I think I'll save that for later. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, that's good. Et uh, Christine, alors comment la COVID a-t-elle uh, créé le bon environnement uh, qui nous a permis d'explorer 
de nouvelles technologies parmi vous? I think, is it okay if I <laughs> respond in English? Yeah. I was prepared for it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, it has definitely accelerated the need to explore new technology, that's for sure. Uh, in fact, it, some say that it propelled us 10 years to 2030 way of work kind of thing. So to navigate constant change, I think we need to adapt to the new technology. Uh, we are in a continuous learning cycle or a new way of doing things, of working, of learning and living. So we need to adapt to those new technologies to be able to, to cope with all the change. Um, and yeah, I, I would say that with everyone working remotely, we had to re rethink the fundamentals. We need to understand what the real needs are. Uh, we realize that being digital is not only about the tools and technology, it's about the people. Uh, I read this in the government digital book from Alex Benet, the former CIO of Canada. Uh, we are adopting new digital tools during a digital mindset through behavioral change, like being agile, one of the digital standard that we are recommended to apply. And in fact, we, we need to adapt Uh, and adapt on the fly, if we can say. Uh, I think we are in a big culture shift where we need to adapt the way that we think, learn, and work. Uh, before we would educate, work, and retire. And now the future and the future of work is more about constant learning or continuous learning. Um, and, and they talk about the T-shaped skills where you deep dive into a topic and you, you learn it and you go, you adapt and go, adapt on the fly. So of the skills required to succeed in the future of work, I think the most important one is learn how to learn. Uh, and I've, I've heard the webcast and they were saying, we need to fall in love with learning. That's basically what it is, uh, just to be able to adapt to the constant change uh, that's coming to us. So I think the pandemic accelerated that process or that that mindset and behavior shift in the way that we think, learn, and work. Absolutely. I, I think you're, you're entirely right that, uh, you know, at the, in the pre-pandemic world, we talked about, you know, creating this environment of continuous learning. And then um, all of a sudden it, it became a necessity, not a, an optional thing that we should work on over the next 10 years. Um, so definitely a, a huge change there. Um, Kieran, we'll uh, go to you for the next uh, question. So you put out a tweet around, Uh, forming a collaborative tool testing group. Um, so can you tell us about uh, why you formed this uh, this testing tool group or tool testing group? Um, and oh, yeah. <laughs> what did you uh, gain from it? Um, and uh, and what did the, the participants gain? Um, yeah, so why did I form the tool testing group? I had, a, as somebody who'd been working in a distrib uh, working from a distance um, for a long time, I sort of had a good sense about what worked well for me. What I didn't have a good sense about is what worked well for others. And so Alex mentioned, you know, people may not have had VPN, but they had Wi-Fi. So, you know, that simultaneously opened up options and maybe closed others, depending on everyone's unique circumstances. So what uh, my direct, uh, so the lovely director I, I I report to somebody called Michelle Anderson. He reports to Guylaine Kidier. So this is the director I'm referring to. Uh, she said, can you please make some recommendations about tools that, um, that will work? Because I need to interact with different people. And so here's the thing. I think we all have to interact with different people, right? We're Canadians working for, we're citizens working for citizens. Um, and so who do I need to interact with? I need to interact with people within my department. I need to interact with people outside of my department who might be in another government department. And I probably want to interact with people outside of government. So Twitter was the best way to get a hold of all those people. <laughs> for me, Twitter was the best way for me to get a hold of all those people. And thankfully, people responded, right? I had retired public servants. I had public servants uh, from other countries who were connected to Canadians somehow. And uh and people in our space. So that's why that's why I did it. What did I get out of it? I got to get answers on what actually worked for other people. And I think 
and I got actually way more out of it than that. But in the, you know, technical, practical side, that's what I got out of it. Um, and I think what the participants got out of it is a safe place to play, right? I called it a sandbox and I, my invitation to them was, can you come and help me break things? <laughs> Because, <laughs> you know, who doesn't like doing that? <laughs> and let's have some fun while we're at it. If we're going to be continually learning, why not have some fun? And so one of the other things I took away is that, hey, grownups like sandboxes too. That's an excellent lesson for sure. Thanks very much for sharing that story. Um, Christine, uh, la prochaine question c'est à vous. Um, alors, nous avons uh, entendu dire que vous étiez un, un véritable gourou des uh, outils technologiques. Uh, alors, quels outils les fonctionnaires doivent-ils savoir utiliser? I like, I like this question. Not sure I'd say a tech tool guru, but on my way to maybe. <laughs> uh, I do like to experiment with tech tools and see what they, uh, as I mentioned before, what they can offer me and the team and uh, if possible to make my life, uh, my work life easier and actually be more efficient. Cause I like to try tools to just make stuff easier, right? Uh, what tools do public servant need to know how to use? Uh, I'm not gonna go in specific cause each tools would be specific to each department or could be uh, at the, depending on the specific department need or the team's need. But I'd say there's two different types of tools. Uh, there's the instant message platform for to have one location to communicate easily with your team and see what's happening uh, within the various groups within your division or your branch. And secondly, common repository for documents. We used to have shared drives. Do you use Google? Google Docs or Office 365 uh, Share Drive, uh, SharePoint, or I'm not sure of all the, the specific names, but they're a common repository for the team to know where to go and for the whole team to know the structure of it. So you know how to look for your documents. Um, for other tools, uh, you, like for example, if you need a project management tool, you can look for Trello, but Trello might not work for your team, but uh, monday.com might work. It, it really depends on your specific uh, team's needs. Um, for example, at uh, Health Canada, we use Slack uh, for the instant message collaboration tool. Uh, and we also use Google Docs and uh, the Google websites. We, we kind of all put all our information, it's kind of like a shared drive, the Google site, and not every department has, has access to it. But we also uh, use emails uh, and recently MS Teams, we were one of the last department to be rolled uh, out to MS Teams. And we are uh, on the Protected B platform, which is awesome. But uh, we are limited in the functionalities as of now, but it's supposed to come uh, in the coming uh, months. Um, as I mentioned before, what is important to know about tools or specific digital tools, they, they are selected by the CIO of each department. And there's actually a website that provides a list of the tools opened by departments. And it's called is this block in my department.com. <laughs> it's a mouthful, right? Is this blocked? in my department.com. So it lists all the tools that are available. So if you're trying to explore one tool and you know that you need to collaborate widely or to collaborate with another department, you can look at the tools that are available for both departments and then you can make it work, make it happen. Uh, we need to explore and experiment tools and see what works for your team. Uh, sometimes something that would work for your team might not work for the other team. So we just have to experiment. And, and, and like Kieran is doing that sandbox experiment, maybe as a, in a safe place or as a small group and then expand and get ambassadors or people that are a bit more knowledgeable on the tool and then they can share tips and tricks. Uh, I've been on Slack for four years. It took me a while to get everybody on board and with COVID, boop, everybody was thanking me and we're so grateful that they knew that way of collaborating uh, prior to COVID. Uh, so yeah, experiment in small groups and expand from there, adapt and go. Uh, I think, yeah, I think that covers it all. I can go on and on, but I'll stop here. 
Oui, certainement. Et je pense que ce site, c'est très utile pour voir comme euh, si tu veux joindre à un, dis, disons, un web diffusion et ça ne fonctionne pas, mais pourquoi est-ce que ça ne fonctionne pas? Um, pourquoi si tu uh, essaies d'utiliser comme Slack ou un autre outil uh, dans votre département, si ça ne fonctionne pas, peut-être c'est parce que c'est bloqué par, uh, par votre, uh, votre uh, système interne, uh, votre, uh, votre CIO a, a décidé que uh, ça ne fonctionne pas pour, uh, pour votre uh, ministère. Um, alors, je pense que c'est très utile et, et je pense que les, les autres points que tu as mentionnés, c'est très utile aussi, que um, utiliser les mêmes choses pour, pour votre équipe, n'utilisez pas comme dix différents uh, outils um, et, et essayer de, de tout faire. Um, so I think uh, you brought up some very valid points of, you know, make sure everyone's kind of using the same platforms. If you're using it across departments, make sure it works um, for sure. And you can you can find some of that out through the, is this blocked in my department? Uh, Sean Boots, I believe, is a, a former CDSer. Um, and no. Okay. He's still a CDSer. He's still ours. He just, oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. He just, uh, he moved to the Yukon, but he's still with us. Oh, wow. Okay. That's, that's a very, that's a very cool place to work from for sure. Um, awesome. So for, for the next question, um, Alex, we'll go to you. Um, so, so why do we sort of in the GC kind of constantly pivot or change the rules um, around which tools we can use? And why are we uh, late adopters uh, of new technology? I guess if we agree that we're late adopters of of new technology. Um, alors, pourquoi dans le, le GC, uh, est-ce que uh, nous pivotons ou changeons uh, constamment les règles, constamment les outils que nous pouvons utiliser? Et uh, pourquoi ad adaptons-nous uh, tardivement les, les nouvelles technologies? So that's a great question. And I would say that it's, it's fair that we change the rules often. I think that if you're the chief information officer for the government or for a department, that that's a really serious responsibility. Um, we've had big hacks in the past. We had the National Research Council hacked. My home department was hacked. Uh, and we've seen in the world, you know, third party actors, foreign governments that hack other governments and, and what that can mean. So I do think that there's a very serious responsibility that those CIOs have in changing the rules to reflect information that they have and experiences that we're seeing internationally is 100% warranted and that is their job. I also think though that we as public servants sometimes feel like they're changing more often than they actually are, or that we have kind of whiplash. And I think that's due to a couple of things. So firstly, so many of the tools in government are, are legacy. They're, they're big tools. We buy them once every five years, 10 years, 15 years, and then we don't really touch them. But then there's that like 10% that we actually have control over. And for that 10%, we are under a lot of pressure to innovate. And we're often under a lot of pressure to do less with more, to make it one size fits all, despite having very, very different needs. Um, and, that, and that can be different data needs, that can be different geographical needs, definitely different user needs. Uh, and so while we're all fighting over that 10%, I think that you can see a lot of different changes within that space and a lot of misunderstanding about the, what the rules actually are. Um, so you mentioned Sean Boots, who's on our policy team, and part of what Sean is so great at is um, sort of like myth busting. So someone will say, well, you can't do that. And Sean and his colleagues are really great at asking why until you get to the real rule. And in a surprising number of cases, there isn't a real rule. It's, it's a rumor. It's a convention. It is a habit that someone has continued to enforce, but there's not actually something there. So I think that with that little bit of room that we have, there's a lot of change and there's a lot of pressure. I would also agree with you. I think we are late adopters of technology, unfortunately. There are a few really great exceptions to that rule and I would love to see those exceptions get broader and broader. Um, but in general, we're a little late to the game. I think that that's common for any organization that's our size and as insular as we are. And unfortunately, I also think part of it is due to a very weak user feedback loop that we have. And, and this is a digital standard. And again, I'm really hoping that culturally we can see this improve, but the people who are using the service are very seldom the people who give advice on what should be bought. The people who are buying this are probably seven layers above whomever's really using it on the ground. And so that person on the ground could say like, this is clunky, this doesn't make any sense. I don't use half of this. 
I have this one really important need that isn't addressed here at all. Um, but the person buying it at the top is so far away from that that they don't really know what good looks like. They don't really have a good assessment of, um, of what, what's out there. Um, my next point is, is a little bit more controversial, but since we're all amongst friends here, the close 150 of us, um, I would also say that the person who's at the top there probably doesn't have a lot of experience buying technology. Um, they're probably not somebody with a STEM background. They're probably not somebody who, again, knows what good looks like, who's been exposed to what is the private sector doing? What are NGOs doing? What is open source right now? What are other governments doing? Some people are, but that requires a lot of diligence and a lot of awareness of the ecosystem that not everyone has or not everyone has time for. Um, and so I think that those are a few of the reasons why we can be late adopters. What's really encouraging is that I think a lot of that is changing. I think events like this increase the digital literacy of the public service such that when these future people become decision makers, they can look across the horizon and sort of spot what good from bad. Um, because I think if you grow up in a, in a culture where you're always so far removed from the decision makers, you also just get used to bad technology. And then you sort of think that like the best thing that's out there is a C is like a C product when really there, there is an A level product out there. You just maybe have never heard of it. Uh, so yeah, those, those are a few of, uh, of my thoughts. Oui, certainement. Et je pense que c'est très clé qu ce que tu dis par rapport à les, les niveaux entre hein, les personnes qui fait le travail, utilise les technologies et puis les personnes qui euh, prennent les décisions pour euh, acheter cette technologie. Je pense peut-être euh, de les services de voyage euh, partagés euh, qui n'ont pas fonctionné bien, mais c'était peut-être les, les adjoints exécutifs des, des sous-ministres ou des, des sous-ministres adjoints qui euh, ont eu des problèmes, mais, mais pas les sous-ministres ou les, les sous-ministres adjoints qui ont utilisé la technologie eux-mêmes euh, quand ça a été euh, implémenté. Alors, Uh, c'est certainement différent de, de faire ces, ces décisions um, sans la connaissance peut-être uh, de, de cette technologie ou d'utiliser cette technologie. So definitely key points around um, the, uh, the users being separated. And I think we talked about that in terms of government services as a whole, that we don't want to be separated uh, from the users. We want to think through that user experience. Um, but certainly some of the past implementations have not um, had that kind of at the forefront. And I think that, that's been a key role Um, of CDS as well to sort of increase that digital literacy um, and uh, and ensure that you know you think about the user experience um, as you're as you're implementing the, the phoenixes and the shared travel services and the um, the next sort of iteration that hopefully we'll we'll kind of work to to improve that for sure. Um, so we'll go to our first uh, question from uh, the audience. Um, so uh, the question is. Uh, do the panelists have any tips um, or tools for managing um, or preventing information overload? Um, and then they define uh, information overload as the difficulty in understanding an issue, effectively making decisions when you have too much information about that issue. Alors, le, le question, c'est par rapport à, à si vous avez des, des pensées par rapport à, à l'information, le, le, le à un, un sur, à avoir un, à trop d'informations um, et comment on peut Uh, comment on peut uh, comme, uh, uh, avoir une solution pour, pour ce type de problème quand tu as trop d'informations et tu ne peux pas prendre une décision um, par rapport à un, 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 uh, un sujet. Um, so, any, uh, anyone want to start with that? Christine. I can. Oh, yeah. go ahead, Christine. Sure. Uh, sure. Uh, it's actually a pretty good question because it is reality. It is what's happening right now. We are bombarded with information coming left and right. And where should we go? What should we do? And that's one of the reaction when we say, let's try a new tool because people are like, oh my gosh, not another tool. I've got so much stuff to do and uh, try to accomplish that in a short period of time, specifically for Health Canada. Uh, well, probably for every department, I, I'm not saying Health Canada most, but it's just because crisis communication and communication during this, this pandemic, uh, we need to constantly update all the information for everybody out there about vaccines, about like everything related to COVID. So when you're bombarded by information, I would try to say, I would say that you need to, to maybe try to streamline communication, like using for us, I, I always go back to Slack because that's the 
instant message platform that we use that we find convenient and and in a short time period that we can just all jump in and do our work and be efficient but it's it's to do work maybe do as a team and we we have teams that are doing what we call team charters where you you establish as a team which tool you're going to use like you're going to use the instant message platform for this specific reason and approvals by emails or or in a specific manner so that you know as an employee or as a manager where to go for what information so maybe you can determine those as a team i think involving everybody in the decision making of those specific location to look for documents like you know you need to scroll this specific document every morning so you know who's absent and what's going on with the team or a specific channel within an instant message platform i think that would be key to try to streamline communication and then you can add other tools but i would start small and go from there oui, certainement. Je pense que c'est clé d'avoir um, qui uh, doit être uh, dans cette, uh, cette situation, qui, qui a besoin de cette information pour faire leur, leur job. Um, et il uh, y a des fois, je pense, avec les, comme les réunions virtuelles et tout ça, que, uh, on évite comme tout le monde. On a comme 30 personnes et on a besoin de comme deux ou trois. Um, alors, ça, ça uh, occupe des fois comme beaucoup de temps pour avoir trop de personnes et trop d'informations um, avec les personnes qui n'ont no, pas besoin. Um, so definitely, uh, definitely key to kind of uh, streamline that information. Do people need this? Do you actually need that FYI or is it actually completely irrelevant? Um, and Kieran, over to you. I see Alex has her hand up too, so I'll, I'll try to be short. Um, the I think this is like one of the realities. Um, my gig, my last gig before this one was with the Canada School of Public Service Digital Academy. And I said in the first month, I feel like I've been hit by a fire hose. And then three months later, I was like, wow, I'm being hit by multiple fire hoses. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's, it, I just think it's part of the reality, which is all the more reason why that continuous learning becomes so important. And all the more reason that from my perspective, that collaboration with others, right? The digital standard becomes more important because I can't know everything and I don't expect anyone else to know everything, but together, maybe we know enough to be able to make better decisions, right? And, and in fact, I'm positive, confident that together we know enough to make better decisions. Um, so uh, I love the team charter idea talking about uh, tools. Uh, as well as other ways that you want to work together. Uh, I think my observation and my personal experience is that my limit is about three, right? I can, I can actively stay on top of about three tools at a time. And it doesn't mean that I can't add others in. It, it just, uh, it means that I might want to switch. So what, what do I need? So be cognizant of different people on your team, what their, you know, capacity and what their need is. And the other thing is, and it becomes super important, just play with other tools, set time aside in your team charter, make it a commitment in your team to play with other tools, have a sandbox hour, like why not? Maybe you'll find something new. And even if you don't find something new, but you've tried different tools, um, it will help you, it'll help you with what you wanna do moving forward. One thing I've learned about tools, it's no tool is perfect. What you want to understand is the strength and the weakness of a tool so that you can pick a tool that's good for your purpose. Absolutely. Alex, over to you. Oui, je voulais juste ajouter tout rapidement que, à mon avis, la première étape, c'est d'être honnête et d'être honnête avec votre gestionnaire, avec votre équipe, et pour pouvoir avoir la discussion que je suis toujours devant un écran, ça n'arrête jamais, j'ai toujours l'information qui me frappe. Euh, alors, je, on, je veux trouver une manière dont euh, je peux consommer juste ce qu'il me faut et que je ne suis pas complètement bouleversée par les formations euh, que, que je trouve euh, chaque jour de, de toute manière. Certainement. Merci beaucoup. 
Euh, la prochaine question des, euh, des questions et réponses, euh, c'est, euh, est-ce qu'on, uh, well, I'll do it in English first and then we'll, we'll switch over to French. Uh, so do you have any tips um, on how to use our new technical skills and tools to emulate the social aspect uh, of the workplace that we've lost, uh, somewhat lost upon the transition to, uh, to working from home? Alors, la question c'est par rapport à, à est-ce que vous avez des, des conseils par rapport à recréer l'aspect social Um, du, uh, de l'environnement du travail um, qu'on a peut-être perdu um, pendant le, les transitions à, à travailler de la maison. Qui veut commencer avec uh, cette question? Who would like to start with this question? I can, I can take a swing at it. Absolutely. Um, so I think firstly, it's really important to recognize that some people love doing it on a screen. Some people like to do it via text and some people will want to do it via audio. And those are all great ways. Uh, so our team uses a lot of Slack and one of our most popular channels is called Pet Pictures. And it's just where people can post photos of their animals. Um, there's always a trigger warning for snakes, but otherwise, you know, there's dogs and cats and bunnies. Um, I've seen like uh, chickens and things like that. So it's just a really fun, different way for people to connect. Uh, and it doesn't matter where you are in the country, you have that fun sort of like water cooler channel Um, where you can where you can post that and it's not strictly work related, but you get to know your colleague a little bit. A lot of people have puppies, you get to see them grow up. So that's really fun. Um, we've also done a lot of walking meetings. So people will purposefully walk and have a discussion and you can pick a topic that's work related or not work related, but it lets people who, you know, just want to get out of their house, get out. Um, and then we've done a lot of good work with small breakout rooms where you can have like a tea room Um, you could have a lounge where people will have a beer. And again, it can be topic specific or just open. Um, you can also do it by geography. So for us, we have a, a very distributed team. Uh, so you don't want to book those things at nine in the morning, Eastern Standard Time, uh, or else your colleagues out West uh, <laughs> will, will not appreciate it. So I think it's about recognizing that different people want to socialize in different ways, both like on camera, off camera, sitting down, moving. Uh, and then getting creative and having a good mix of like a book club that people have read, the animals that they may have, what are our counterparts internationally doing, uh, and then sort of day to day stuff like what, what's the hottest thing in Java right now, let's have a conversation about it. Um, but meeting people where they are and offering a lot of different choices. That's fantastic. Thanks, Alex. Uh, Christine and Kieran, any other uh, ideas? Christine. Uh, actually, they're pretty uh, pretty much the same, and I was replying uh, the, to type an answer uh, option in the Q and A. And I did mention I do use the walk and talk for for the quick update meeting, right? Like that you know what you're working on, and you don't need to share a tool. If you do need to share a tool, or or not a tool, but a document or material for the the pre the, the meeting, you can send it ahead of time or after the meeting. And for me, it has been working perfectly because I would I would let the other person know. By the way, I'm going to take this meeting uh, with my phone and I'm going for my for forest walk I need some fresh air and the, most of the time people are like if they can and they can leave their house there they don't have any kids uh, needing them at the moment then they they were like oh this is interesting I'm, I'm going to do the same so I kind of you kind of create this movement or this momentum with people. They they don't think about it uh, until you mention it. We do have water cooler uh, channels and the pet photo channel uh, is the same. Um, it's always fun because it's whenever you need a few minutes to di disconnect from from a project to project, it's it's a great way to go in, jump and have a little discussion and somebody replies when they have time. So it's convenient. And we also have this uh, wellness at work channel because pre-COVID I was offering some uh, workouts session in the boardroom. We were working out in the boardroom, I kid you not, uh, around this big conference table, we made it happen. And so I continued those session uh, virtually. And I also offer sometimes meditation session or the stress release uh, guided meditation. So those are uh, pretty popular and it, it gets, it's getting people to move and to, to show what we're doing and, and sharing it, right? It's, it's again, this digital era is all about the people. So let's share what we're doing. And it might, it might trigger, like it might invite somebody else to do the same. And we just share the joy, share the, 
the joy that comes out of it, maybe we could say. Absolutely. Those are some, uh, some great, uh, great ideas in terms of uh, different ways to, to engage. Uh, Kieran, over to you. Oh, thank you. I was just going to add, I, I'll have to revisit walking meetings now that I've heard Alex and Christine say it, because uh, I'm always worried about the breathing hard, right? Like I'm, I, I haven't moved a lot in the past year or two years. And so if I'm moving, I'm like, oh man, it's going to sound so awkward. And so I've been hesitant. So I'm going to revisit it. And I share this out loud um, because even if you've tried something in the past, try it again. It's okay. If something didn't work last time, maybe either expectations have shifted uh, something with the technology might have shifted, try it again. Just like, you know, if you thought you didn't like yams when you're tried six months, a year later, you might find you like them. Um, to, I'm going to share uh, two or three other things. And uh, yeah, pets channels are awesome. I love them. I've sometimes for mental health purposes said, uh, can somebody please share a pet image? Thank you. And <laughs> generally, you know, you get flooded. It's great. Uh, two other things um, that I've seen people Three other things I've seen people use. Uh, my, uh, the director, not mine, the director uh, where I work, Elin, she has what she calls a five minute icebreaker at the beginning of a meeting. And sometimes uh, she's a very dynamic individual and sometimes the questions are crazy. Uh, I can be a little more mild and sometimes their questions like, what's your favorite color? Um, often they're actually a little more interesting though, not just your favorite color, but something that you can answer quickly and warm yourselves up and you do start to get to know each other as well. Um, I think uh, Neil Bauer used Kumo Space. I mean, I had heard of it, but I hadn't really played with it before. And so it's always interesting to watch an executive be using a, a different uh, tool or introducing a different tool. I think that's awesome. Um, and then my free agent colleague for us having uh, informal get togethers, she's used, her name's Lily Speck and she's used Wonder Me. So uh, again, not VPN, Wi-Fi. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, et, et puis, uh, comme tu as mentionné, que, uh, Neil Bauer, qui est le, le, vice, le vice président, uh, président adjoint, je ne sais pas le, le mot en français, mais uh, qui est président adjoint du, uh, de l'École de la fonction publique du Canada, fait les, les heures uh, de bureau ouvertes pour uh, toutes les personnes qui sont à uh, souvenir. Alors, uh, c'est une invitation ouverte pour uh, venir pour, pour cinq minutes, disons, ou dix minutes, ou pour à uh, l'heure uh, en total et pour uh, juste uh, avoir une conversation, si vous voulez, avec Neil, avec quelqu'un d'autre qui est là. Um, et puis, le, le plateforme de Kumo Space, c'est très uh, utile pour, uh, pour faire ce type d'engagement. Um, so, Kumo Space, uh, as I was mentioning in French, um, is, uh, and as Kieran mentioned, is, is really interesting to use, but uh, Neil uh, uses it for open office hours. So, everyone under Neil comes in if they want. Um, and uh, they can pop in for five minutes. Hey, I have a question about this. It can kind of break down some of those barriers um, and the, the uh, uh, sort of barriers to, uh, to action. If you're just coming and you have a question about a project you're working on, you just need, need uh, feedback on it, or you want to just engage with your, your colleagues from uh, wherever you can do that. And Wonder Me is a tool that we've used at uh, the Federal Youth Network um, for networking sessions um, as well. Um, Zoom can also be used for, for that purpose uh, to do like speed mentoring and stuff like that. So there are definitely like a host of tools. Um, so it's just a matter of um, kind of getting on them and then getting your, your colleagues um, on board. But, you know, whether you're, you're setting up any of the things mentioned, um, it's all sort of better than, than not doing it, right? So um, the next question, um, I felt uh, at times uh, very overwhelmed to learn new tech um, and seem behind the times. Um, any advice on uh, how to get over this? Alors, le, le question, c'est uh, que les personnes uh, 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 avaient les, les pensées que uh, c'était trop d'apprendre les le nouvelles technologies um, et uh, uh, qu'ils ou elles uh, pensent qu'ils sont uh, comme, uh, à l'autre côté uh, comparé à ses, à ses collègues uh, par rapport à la, à la technologie. Um, alors, est-ce que vous avez des conseils uh, de... Uh, d'avoir un, un performance supérieur par rapport à la technologie um, et d'avoir l'engagement le, um, du, du technologie nouveau. Um, so who would like to start with this question? So feeling overwhelmed on, on new tech and feeling kind of behind the times, which I think is uh, probably 70% uh, of the public service on you know, March 16th, 2020, who felt like, oh no, <laughs> how do I do this? 
Uh, maybe yeah. I'll, I'll just quickly hop in. Um, Alex, Christine, and myself had an opportunity to meet beforehand, and uh, I, I was really taken with something um, that Christine said was to really spend some time learning a tool. And, and in my head, I was thinking, oh, I'm going to let her speak to that. For me, um, it, it's more have, have an awareness of it. So it's just trying it out long enough to figure out if you want to learn more, if you want to have that in-depth practice. Um, so it, you know, you don't, it doesn't have to be a lifelong commitment. You don't have to sign up. You don't have to subscribe. <laughs> you can do a one hour test. You can do a one day test. You can test it out for two weeks. It's okay. You know, there's everything's got its own little window. Just be aware. And you don't have to make the big commitment, right? Like, go date your tools for lack of a better word, go, you know, check them out, figure out if this relationship is good for you. <laughs> oui, certainement. Ce n'est ne pas uh, d'utiliser les le technologies uh, pour un, un temps infini, uh, infiniment, comme pour l'utiliser pour cinq années si ça ne fonctionne pas bien pour uh, votre, uh, votre organisation. Uh, Alex. Sure. So despite working in a very tech forward place, it I'm not great. Um, and what I have found personally helpful is YouTube. Um, you can YouTube it. Uh, and you can generally find like beginner, intermediate, advanced, and then super advanced all on YouTube. Um, I, I also Google a lot of things. Um, I'm blessed in that I have a lot of, of really kind colleagues. And I, if you're open about the fact that like, I will try this, but I am apprehensive. And you know, I know what a floppy disk is. And so Like I, I grew up at a time when this was very different and very hardware focused. Um, I think that you'll find a lot of people willing to take you along through that journey. I would also say that if you feel like you don't fully know what's out there in the ecosystem, if you are comfortable with Twitter, there are a few key people, some of whom have been listed in this chat, who if you follow on Twitter, they can point you in the right direction of what's on the horizon. Increasingly, as more and more governments work in the open, you can also take a peek at what they're doing. So like, what is the UK doing in this problem space and what tools and software are they employing? Um, because they're generally a bit more ahead. What is Australia doing? And even some governments like Singapore have a surprising amount of information in the open and in English. So you can get a really good feel for what other governments are doing, what tools are and aren't working. Um, but I would also just say that it's okay to, to feel that feeling. And the most important thing is to identify like, what is the outcome that I want this tool to provide me? And if it's not working for you, that's okay. Um, and, and try try to find a workaround. But uh, to, to Kieran's point, be curious and, and get out there. And, and when in doubt, Google is your friend. They're the largest company in the world for a reason. Absolutely. Uh, Christine, over to you. Yes, th those are great points that uh, were both raised by Kiran and Alex. Uh, I would add that there's no perfect time. Uh, you are not alone to feel that way, by the way. Uh, it's, it's completely normal and it's okay. It's okay not to know everything about everything, right? It's knowing the right people to help you. <laughs> But uh, I would say that there's no perfect timing to learn a tool. Uh, I know sometimes like, like for us for COVID related stuff, oh my gosh, I can't learn this, this new tool because we're swamped and bombarded and doing overtime most of the time. So when am I going to find the time? What I propose to you for that is we're 2021. So do 21 minutes of learning per day in 2021. So that makes it like less overwhelming. And, and, In my opinion, of course, you can check the tutorial and Google and the YouTube videos. Uh, those have been very practical for me, and I've been sharing those a lot. Uh, they, 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 you can actually Google them, and sometimes I wanted to learn something in French, not in English. So it, that's all available at the fingertips, which is nice. But yeah, you can, you'd be surprised sometimes if you just talk to your co colleagues and that you, you mentioned that you, you be curious to explore this tool or you're not sure. And, and another, to, another uh, location that you can start from is the Digital Academy 
uh, bus rides. Busrides.ca is an awesome location to go to to be able to just start reading. If you want, you can do 21 of 21 minutes of reading per day. You can you can go on social media. You can get back on LinkedIn if you're not there or or if you are you were there but not really active. You can just go back and follow different hashtags. Follow specific like GC Digital. Uh, follow Flex GC. We provide a bunch of tools and a bunch of blogs and material that are very great resources, in my opinion. So there's different ways that you can integrate it into your routine because some would say, I don't have two hours per day to go and watch videos. So you try to squeeze it in where you can. You can do podcasts, audio files. There's so many stuff out there. You can like some, I've been obsessed with podcasts since COVID. I, I had a friend who mentioned it to me years ago and I was like, I don't have time to sit and watch a video for an hour and a half. And now I go for walks an hour and a half. And sometimes I keep walking around the block just to, to do the, to finish the podcast. And, and I listen to podcasts on health and wellness, but I also been listening to a lot of podcasts on digital transformation on, on uh, yeah, digital <laughs> literacy stuff. So it's a great way to try to get active and moving and also learning at the same time. So 21 minutes in 2021, uh, I think is a feasible uh, way to do it. Oui, c'est une très, très bonne idée, euh, c'est 21 minutes. Et puis, euh, comme tu as mentionné, l'École de la fonction publique du Canada avec l'Académie numérique a beaucoup d'outils. Um, et puis, euh, Marcel a mis le uh, lien pour Bus Rides dans le, uh, dans le chat. Et puis, uh, pour FlexJC, uh, qui a beaucoup d'outils aussi um, et uh, des conseils et, et tout ça. Uh, the next question. Um, so, this is around, you know, people being kind of disconnected from... Uh, from the decision making, um, as you mentioned before, Alex, um, any recommendations on how someone working on the floor um, can help improve uh, in-house created systems, um, especially when we have no idea they're being created and do not appear to have uh, input. Um, alors, les, les questions, c'est uh, par rapport à les, les systèmes qui sont créés par un ministère et puis uh, qui n'ont pas peut-être uh, les, les l'engagement des utilisateurs de ce système um, avant que c'est créé. Alors, comment est-ce qu'on peut engager, comment est-ce qu'on peut comprendre les, les projets uh, qui créent ces nouveaux systèmes et uh, d'avoir un, un peu uh, nos conseils dans le, le formation de ces systèmes? Um, so, Alex, maybe we'll start with you on this question. Sure. Um, and, and I mean, firstly, I just want to thank the person who, who asked that. Um, and, and just my heart goes out to you. I have a lot of empathy. I think that's a really tricky situation to be in. I think the advice that I would give, if you have a manager who is open to it, I would articulate the feedback that you have. Um, you could cite the digital standards and you can say, this is what the federal government has set as a standard. And if, if no one is talking to me, um, they're not hitting the mark. Um, and, that, and that's a problem. Uh, I would also say that depending on your situation, you can highlight with precision exactly what your experience is. So you could go to your manager and say, you know, the, the real problem here that we're trying to solve would be fixed by a baton twirler and a really good drummer. And I'm worried that you're going to buy the full marching band. And I'm going to tell you that that's going to be like really, really loud and really noisy. And you're going to need to close a bunch of streets and get into a lot of red tape and jump through a whole bunch of hoops when the problem that we're really trying to solve is in this very acute area. And I think we could move a lot faster and learn a lot more if we just tackled this one area. I think if you can give feedback like that um, in, in a way that is that is concise and that is thoughtful, And especially if you can relate it to the users. So if those are if those users are the public, that is a very powerful argument. If those users are public servants, that's still a very powerful argument. I would hope um, that you would have a boss who could take that up the food chain and hopefully get some more um, some more impact uh, and just transparency into what's going on there. Uh, I would also maybe just say that none of these procurements happen overnight. And so while it can feel really stressful and like you have to do all of this urgently, um, you know, there are lots of points of, infer of intervention within that procurement. So I would try to start having those conversations and, and be patient as, as they sort of work their way up. Absolutely. 
Uh, Christine, Kieran, any uh, thoughts on that question? I think Alex covered covered it all in my opinion. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, so I see we're getting towards the end of our time. Um, so with a few minutes left, I will uh, I will ask a closing question uh, with uh, responses from each of you. So um, the question is, uh, what's one technology or tool um, that people aren't using that they should be? Um, alors, la dernière question, c'est uh, quelle est la technologie ou l'outil que les gens n'utilisent pas et qu'ils devraient utiliser? Um, et on espère que les réponses de, de chacun de vous, c'est uh, complètement différent. Um, so, uh, hopefully, you each have very different responses. Um, but, Christine, we'll start with you. Phew! <laughs> uh, I would say, well, I, I kind of mentioned it already, but I would say podcasts. For me, it was a big game changer. Uh, to listen because you can listen while walking but if you're not into going for a walk and stuff like that you can also listen to a podcast while you're folding laundry or while you're preparing a meal there's different ways to do it so definitely podcasts uh, is a great way to learn and we seem to need to learn so many things that for me that's the one tool I'd recommend in in yeah podcast uh Kieran over to you So Josh, is this the the one, is this about the tool that I think we need to use? Yes. Yeah, there's a, and the reason I asked that specifying question, because like most things in my life, there's an intersection. <laughs> so the intersection for me is, I think the one tool that, that we all need to start using um, is any tool that helps us visualize and communicate our work. So make our work visible. We're, uh, you know, we used to have bulletin boards or there used to be posters or we would see information up as we were walking around and going to different places. When you don't have that available, making your work visible and actually knowing what you're doing with each other and that communication and supporting that change management are super helpful. And the intersection for me is I mentioned it, right? How does mind start is the, well, not, I shouldn't say start, but one of the doors that opens is when a manager says, please go find out about, um, you know, when people like Christine say, take 21 minutes every day to learn. So there's, I think the intersection with people where, you know, leaders of teams are encouraging people to do that. And if you're an employee, you don't have to wait for that invitation. You can start doing it too. So uh, if I, you know, there we go. That's what I'll say. Um, thank you. Absolutely. Uh, Alex, over to you. Sure. So my recommendation may be for those who are um, more in like the intermediate comfort level with tools, but I would recommend GitHub, which is G-I-T-H-U-B. So this is a tool used by software developers for building software in the open, and it will let you see what they're doing and how they're building it. Um, and you can be a member of the public and you can ask questions, you can see everything come together. Uh, and so it's free to, to join. Um, you're more than welcome to pop into the CDS repository. You can watch us building the COVID alert application, for instance. And I think it will just increase folks' understanding of how to build software openly and then also just how to build software in general. Uh, and if you don't know how to do it, I know that there's a, a YouTube tutorial because I have used it myself. Absolutely. Um, and I'll, I'll give two final recommendations uh, just to emphasize YouTube University is free and uh, uh, you don't have to apply to, to get in. Definitely useful for, for many skills um, and to learn you know, quick tips on, on how to do something you don't know how to do. Um, and the second is Slack. Uh, I think it's a game changer. And we've used it for our, our Federal Youth Network team for some time. Um, and it's, it's cut down on email volume and um, increased the speed at which you can collaborate um, rapidly and across multiple departments. Um, alors, uh, ça finit notre, notre uh, conversation aujourd'hui um, avec uh, nos panelistes, uh, Christine, Alex, et puis uh, Kieran. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Christine, Alex, and Kieran for joining us today for this uh, very uh, interesting and engaging discussion on technical skills. Um, as I mentioned, um, the session has been recorded um, and uh, will be online uh, shortly. Uh, Kieran, uh, you have a final thought. 
I just want to share, there's so many amazing questions and I know we didn't get to them all. I know people voted up on them. If, uh, if people want to still ask those questions and engage in conversation, Twitter is one of the best places to get a hold of me. Uh, if you share them through Finn and Finn's able to share them with me, I'm, I'm good with that. I just, uh, I know we may not have got to all of them. And so if people have more, I'd be really open to that. So thank you, Josh. Yes, absolutely. I'm so humbled yeah. to be on a panel with Christine and Alex. I'm like, oh, yay. <laughs> Same here. Absolutely. No, there are a lot of great questions in chat, and we, we did not have time to get to them all. But uh, definitely, uh, we have provided uh, each of your contact information think, for, for LinkedIn. So uh, feel free to reach out to our panelists, but also, you know, um, pose these questions in the open. I think uh, what I really like about uh, lots of the people on, on Twitter, like Abe, Abe Greenspoon, will just put something up and um, then there will be a long thread of discussion about it and people people help other people in terms of learning these tools or uh, you know learning the culture or, or just having an open discussion um, on Twitter or other tools. Um, alors, uh, je vous remercie d'être uh, venu aujourd'hui. Um, Assurez-vous de vous inscrire au prochain événement chaque mardi. Um, so we have uh, two uh, more events uh, in this series um, on the, the future of the GC. Uh, future of work uh, coming up on uh, April 20th and April 27th. So please uh, register for those events. Mar Marcella has put the link in the chat. Um, alors, merci à nos panelists. Merci à nos uh, participants de partout au Canada. Uh, thank you for joining uh, today's uh, FYN virtual learning series. Um, have a great day, everyone, and uh, we'll see you soon. Alors, merci à, à tous. Et puis, uh, on vous... Uh, on vous uh, uh, espère que uh, on va vous joindre pour le uh, le prochaine séance uh, mardi le le 20 avril. Thanks very much everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Merci. Mm -hmm.